Okay, I look forward to hearing from it. And we've had us are already starting to move forward. So what about climate action? First of all, climate action, um, the, org the organization that we work with and who are organizing this event. Um, this is just a little bit about us. Um, we've worked historically with the United Nations Environment Program to engage the private sector in all different kinds of work uh, to promote the reduction of carbon emissions um, and impact climate change. So that's a little bit about us and who we are to set the scene. Um, this webinar is in conjunction, with, in conjunction with a meeting that we are hosting in Munich next month, uh, Sustainable Innovation in Sport 2017. Um, we're super excited about it. There's been a lot of work happening over the last 18 months around this particular area. Um, obviously, it's a, a huge area of importance for us all. And what we're really trying to focus on today is the technology side. At the meeting, there's a whole host of... Um, of topics looking at the legacy of sustainability in sport, at mega sports events. Um, we're looking at broadcast, we're looking at the role of eco-athletes, um, a vast range um, of topics will be covered. So you can check out um, the website there and also there's a webinar discount you can see there uh, for yourselves joining today. We're delighted to have you um, and you can get 10% off your pass to the conference with that code there and we'll show that again later on. Um, okay, so what we want to talk about today is how technology is driving sustainability in sport. Um, the, the main focus of this um, session today is obviously technology, although there are lots of other facets to this. Um, our overarching perspective is through education engagement around these things. First of all, how sport itself can be more sustainable and how sport can use its influence to engage fans and encourage wider scale responsible behaviour. So the first area we want to talk about is the use of technology in stadiums and venues. This is obviously an area where we can see some serious um, impact. The technology we're talking about are the likes of renewable energy, LED lighting, uh, water reduction and waste management. Um, it's, you know, uh, stadiums are the heart of sport, welcoming so many millions of fans each year. It's an obvious um, place to look at um, in terms of the construction, but also the hosting of live events. Um, a couple of stadiums to mention, for example, here in London, the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park, um, that was the 2012 Olympics host. Um, some stats around that, 90% of their demolition waste was reused or recycled, um, and 90% of construction waste was diverted from, from landfill. Um, they used half the steel um, that would usually, usually be used to create the 80,000 seat stadium. Um, and a third of recycled content, and it requires 60% less water than its counterpart. So some big stats there. And the Allianz Arena, which you can see on the slide, um, is has 380,000 energy-efficient LEDs, so LED lighting making a huge impact. And they're 60% more energy efficient than some of its counterparts and saving 362 tons of carbon dioxide per year, so making big impact on that. Other things we can see in stadiums are, for example, the use of solar on rooftops and technology to reduce toilet flushing and pitch irrigation to save water and waste management are all different technologies which are driving the industry towards a lower footprint. Transport is another key area, um, obviously not just um, transport in terms of fans getting to and from games, but um, team travel as well. Um, so the technology side of that, we can see Roland Garros is a great example of that, um, and Vivian Frace will join us at Sustainable Innovation Sport next month to discuss it this further. Um, they have a carbon calculator app. Um, which showed, promotes low impact transport. They also have a website for carpooling um, and obviously they extensively advertise the best public transport options. Um, also highlight their UA for Euro 2016 which had a hugely successful eco calculator as well and EVs as well. So um, obviously people either carpooling or using lower um, emission transport are big ways that we can, we can impact um, that. And Roland Garros use a hybrid uh, fleet as well, which means that 62% um, of the official fleet generate lower CO2 emissions, making making a big impact there as well. So, transport another um, another facet. Equipment 
is another one. Um, we're talking about sustainable technology, so for this session we want to highlight some of the tech initiatives such as uh, Patagonia, who make polyester for fleeces from recycled bottles, which you can see there. Um, Adidas, obviously, famously last year, um, had a line of shoes made from ocean waste. Um, and Niche and Mothership, which is a snowboard manufacturer, they use alternative materials and manufacturing and have a really um, sustainable supply chain and are making really big strides in the, in the snowboarding um, community, which we know are highly affected by climate change and the reduction of snow in some key areas as well, so something that's very close to the heart of people um, who snowboard or ski. Um, and then finally, I want to draw attention to sustainable sports and teams. Um, obviously, we're fortunate enough to be joined um, by Susie Thompson from Land Rover Bar and Julia Pally from Formula E today. A um, couple of pictures of their awesome technology, which they're going to tell us all about shortly. Um, but I also wanted to highlight uh, Forestry Green Rovers as being a team in the UK that have really dedicated themselves um, to this in regard to like their first organic football pitch, solar power, and they have a water harvesting system that means every drop of water is recycled, and even the team kits washed in phosphate-free washing powder. But I did just want to highlight this little um, uh, machine that you can see down there in the bottom left corner, which is called an Etesia ET mower. Um, and it's a, a state-of-the-art robotic mower used by Bayern Munich as well. Um, and it reduces cost of pitch maintenance, labor and maintenance costs, and energy bills. So basically, it's, it's running cost of zero because it charges from solar panels. So it keeps energy consumption really, really small, no fuel or noise to deal with. And it also mulches all the grass and puts it back in um, as well. So something that's really highly sustainable and, and a really interesting really interesting technology there as well. So they're, they're just a quick snapshot overview of the various technologies that exist right now that are driving sustainable um, sustainability in sport. We are delighted to be joined, as I said, by Land Rover Bar and Formula E representatives which have really put sustainability in sport at the very core of their mission. Um, Julia and Susie who will be joining us um, and we are delighted to have an all-female panel today as well. Um, so what I'm going to do um, before I pass over to Julia is just remind you that you can ask your questions via Twitter with the hashtag SIS17, follow us at Climate Action um, or you can also email your questions to Dan Cole and his email is at the bottom there or in your desktop in front of you you should see a little question um, box where you can chat and ask questions so you can drop them through to us on there as well. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Julia Pally, um, who is the sustainability manager for the Formula E championships. Uh, Julia, you should be with us now. Hello, everybody. Perfect. So whenever you're ready, Julia, we're really excited to hear more about Formula E. So wherever you're ready. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to start by a quick introduction on, on myself and my job. Uh, so, I'm Sustainability Manager at Formula E, which is the electric street racing series. And, um, I mean, that's a really exciting job because Formula E is one of the very few sports that inherently promotes sustainability. As you can see, it's an electric car being at the core of a, of a racing car championship. So for those who don't know uh, Formula E, just a few words on the, on the key points about the championship. So we race in city centers. So um, we, we race on temporary tracks within the cities. It's uh, definitely a sport. There's a lots of action on track. And uh, the core of the whole championship is the electric car, but uh, an electric car that is powered with uh, renewable energy. And that's what we want to show to uh, the people attending that electric vehicles are really um, affordable and that's something that you can you can buy and you can drive for yourself. And next slide, please. So um, the reason why of Formula E and the creation of this championship is to is to give a solution, to offer a solution to air quality issues in city center. So we, we are fighting climate change, or at least we are trying to, to do our best to show that there are solutions for everyone um, to, to fight climate change by buying an electric car. Next, please. Um, so the, 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 the reason uh, why Formula E is so important in the, in the motorsport and sports industry is that we act as a technological laboratory 
in order to break down the uh, barriers to uh, the electric vehicle mass market adoption. So those barriers are the technology, so the fact that, as you may know, um, the batteries uh, and the, the life uh, of the batteries uh, has been so far a bit a bit too short uh, and was giving some sort of anxiety for the people to buy an electric car. So that's something that we are working really hard on and I will come back on the improvements that have already, are already been made. The perception of the electric vehicles, which were seen, um, I would say, before maybe as a bit boring and not very fun and sexy, which is completely different through the championship because we present a very fun, very fast, and a very, a very sexy car uh, in, a, in, a, in a city street environment so that people can immediately see themselves driving uh, electric vehicles of that kind. And obviously, probably the most important, because that's the first step, the infrastructure. So as soon as we come to a city, um, it's a major commitment also from the, from the host city uh, who agrees to host us. And so it's, it's something that we really push and really highlight in the negotiations that uh, having a major commitment on electric vehicle development means um, having the, the appropriate infrastructure for recharging the cars. Next, please. So um, in terms of the technologies, uh, the first season, um, the, um, the common manufacturers have been given all the same cars. And if you click, uh, so that the rest of the slide appear. Yes, um, thank you. Um, in season two, uh, we had officially seven car manufacturers that were entering and uh, I would say adding their own technology. So that's the, the test bed and the technological uh, platform of Formula e was just starting. It's in season three, we've had new car manufacturers. One of the most iconic, especially here in UK, uh, was Jaguar Land Rover, who, uh, who joined the, the championship. And uh, those car manufacturers uh, have, I would say, increasingly more space to test uh, their technologies around electric vehicles. But the most important one being the battery, uh, the aim is that in season five, those manufacturers uh, have four N to, to have only uh, one battery lasting the entire race. So just to remind for those who don't uh, know the, let's say the how Formula A functions, so far we have um, two cars per driver because the, the battery doesn't last the entire race, which is more or less one hour. And so our objective in just five seasons is to double the battery capacity, which, is, which will obviously trickle down throughout the entire uh, industry of uh, car manufacturers and electric vehicles with, uh, I would say, direct benefits on, passenger, on passengers' cars. Next, please. Um, so, I don't know, the slides seem to be a bit, yeah, so I, it's, it's, com it's coming. Um, so, the, on, the, on the car batteries, I uh, just wanted to highlight um, a quote from our, um, our, let's say, big boss, Jean the, the president of FIA, as uh, Formula E is sanctioned uh, as an FIA championship. So, um, he's, um, he's pointing the fact that Formula E is, is literally a testbed and a tele technological laboratory for the battery development that's already um, through the first three seasons we've been able to, um, to increase the battery lasting of 25% and that uh, in the next two seasons we will, we will double it. Um, so that's, that's an amazing uh, innovation and it's really important for the whole uh, automotive industry. Um, also, um, a, great, a great opportunity for Formula E is to, is to show that not only we are a testbed for electric vehicle technology, but we are a testbed for uh, what is the future of uh, electric, of uh, not only electric, but for cars and for racing in general. So that's why we are testing new technologies uh, such as the, the driverless cars, the, the support race that we call Robo Race where we have uh, 10 cars uh, driverless competing against each other on our tracks. Um, and that's really important because we want to be at the forefront and be uh, always testing the latest technologies uh, in the automotive industry. Next, please. Uh, 
Um, so all this, all this um, research around uh, technology and sustainability uh, is also uh, possible thanks to our partners who are also experts in sustainability. So I've just given you um, a, quick, uh, a quick idea of uh, who they are and what they do. Uh, Qualcomm, for example, is testing through the championship their Halo charging technology, where basically it's wireless charging. And you can imagine that in the future, you could simply park your car in the street or in front of your house and not even like having to plug it so that it's recharged. Uh, RE100, with, with who we are working, the climate group, obviously, um, is also help, helping us to shape um, a renewable energy program in, uh, in conjunction with NL or uh, energy partner. So, so that's the renewable energy that we use to power our events um, is, is becoming uh, fully, uh, fully renewable because we power our cars with renewable energy thanks to glycerin fuel, which is the euro emission, but we want to go further. And that's why it's important to be part of that. And that's why NL is helping us with their microgrid solutions um, to, to improve and to increase our renewable energy use. Obviously, Williams, uh, who I, I more or less already mentioned through the battery issues that, uh, and the battery, let's say, challenge that we have, uh, are really key because they are uh, the ones that uh, are working on this battery technology and have done already uh, enormous achievements in improving the battery lasting and who would make um, all dreams, let's say, come true by uh, having one battery in season five for the entire race. Also very important in the motorsport world, the tires, which are hybrid in the sense that we have just one set of tires for the entire uh, race and that they can go for wet and dry conditions and all those tires are recycled and that's thanks to Michelin, which is an amazing partner and a very, very sustainable expert. Last but not least, DHL who is helping us to shape um, a most sustainable, uh, a more sustainable calendar or I would say as, as sustainable as possible because obviously since we, we do races all over the, ro the world, we have to travel all over the world and so does the material. But the HL is helping us to, um, to have a sort of cluster approach region by region and testing new technologies uh, to deliver our, our material. So yeah, that's, um, that's only possible because we have uh, those experts that uh, are keen and want to test new technologies to improve sustainability. Next, please. Um, so directly uh, on the events, um, as I mentioned, the renewable energy is, is really key because we, we, are, uh, we are aware and we want people to be aware that uh, electric vehicles only reach their full power when they are powered with uh, clean and renewable energy. So uh, we really try to highlight and showcase renewable energy through the village, which is the, the fan zone. And we, we, tr we really try to advertise as much as possible the fact that the cars that we use and the cars that race are powered with these glycerin generators. So uh, it's basically 100% uh, clean and zero emission energy because glycerin is, um, is producing no, um, no emissions. And uh, as it's written, in just one, uh, one hour of uh, production of energy, we reduce by half a ton uh, of CO2 emissions and half a kilogram of NOx, uh, which is uh, which is why we virtually reach um, reach zero emission uh, energy production to power our cars, and it's it's really key to us. It's been since the beginning that we use this innovative technology, and uh, that's uh, that's really important. The last thing is um, the example of our of our Visa London EPRI. So that was the the very last EPRI of season two. Uh, where we've we've managed to reach 80% uh, uh, power uh, renewable power for the entire race, which we're really proud of because we've been using uh, various um, renewable energy. So obviously the the glycerin uh, for the cars, uh, but also uh, vegetable oil uh, generators uh, to power some other parts of the event, and also uh, the first ever solar farm in the in the e village where people were able to. Um, I would say to, to benefit and to enjoy that by charging their phones or um, just like having some 
dense floor where they could generate energy themselves. Um, and so that's that's also a, a very important belief that we have is that we we have to make uh, new technologies and sustainable technologies really fun and accessible to to our audience so that they they want to adopt to adopt, to adopt it. Next, please. Sorry, Jitters, it's like super slow transition yeah, for some no reason. I don't know if it's going to pop through in a minute. The computer is <laughs> up. There we today. go. <laughs> I know, um, it's in the January. They need to fix it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the very last and the latest, let's say, example of uh, how we are trying to use all technology to promote uh, sustainability through all sport is the project Eyes. So uh, you might have seen that we brought one of our uh, one of our cars. Um, oops, it seems that uh, time is is going too fast. <laughs> I don't know if we can come back to the previous slide. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we brought one of our cars uh, on the on the on the Greenland and the on one of the icebergs. I mean, actually, we wanted to bring the car on the icebergs, and it's not been possible because they were melting too fast. So we had to uh, we had to go to to actually uh, the the Greenland, uh, but the the soil of the Greenland and not the the icebergs themselves. And so the whole point was to was to create awareness on global warming and use the iconic symbols of the icebergs that keeps breaking and melting. Uh, out of that, we've been uh, we've been producing a documentary and obviously uh, some short content for the for the social media with um, a very good um, I mean I would say amazing results in terms of uh, followership and viewership. Uh, which is great because the whole point of this operation was was to show again that climate change is a reality, and and something that is going to impact us like tomorrow uh, massively, and that electric vehicles are not the only one solution, but they are part of the solution to solve the the problem. Um, something important to point is that we also took the opportunity of this uh, expedition in uh, in Greenland. To, uh, to join forces with Southampton University so that they can do research uh, on the iceberg and, the, and the, the how uh, icebergs are forming together. So uh, it's, it's a big legacy for us uh, as part of this Project ICE and, um, and next summer actually they are coming back on, on our behalf to implement a new tracker so that they can do, uh, they can gather uh, scientific data and do some research and hopefully advance the scientific community. Next, please. Yeah, so that's uh, that's the the words uh, the words to finalize the presentation. So we we really believe that we are the future of uh, sustainable transportation in smart cities. In the cities of the future, um, just five words to describe uh, what what we believe uh, is the future of sustainable transport. Obviously, electric as all cars, clean as the way we power our cars, connected as we think that um, it's it's the cities of the future will have uh, transportation all over collected uh, to and very uh, clever uh, connection. Sure, because we don't think that uh, the future is to, is to drive individual cars and autonomous, as I was mentioning, the driverless cars that we are testing through the championship. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Julie. That was fascinating, and we've had um, a number of questions in for you already, but I think we're going to hold it till the end, if that's okay. Sure. No problem. <laughs> had the pleasure of coming to one of your races as well in Marrakesh, though I have a couple of things I want to ask you about as well. Um, sure. But that's what it, so the questions have been coming in, um, and we're going to get to those at the end. Um, and next, I am delighted to introduce Susie Thompson, um, who is the Sustainability Manager for Land Rover Bar um, Americas, who should be with us now as well. Susie, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Wonderful. Um, so we're, we're good to go, and you are. Thanks again for joining us. Yeah, brilliant, thanks very much. Um, so yeah, I'm Sustainability Manager for the Land Rover BAR 
America's Cup racing team. So that's Ben Ensley Racing's America's Cup team. So we established the team back in uh, 2014. So reasonably new and from the outset really set out to um, embed sustainability into the team and into what the team was all, around, all about. So looking to uh, to deliver sustainability across everything from operations through to, you know, looking at the race boats and, and, and how we build and design and, and design those and how that could drive sustainability further. Um, so my background, I mean, I've been involved in sport for a long time and luckily enough been involved with the London 2012 Games and Ryder Cup and previous America's Cup teams and national governing bodies. So watching how sport has really um, started to drive, at, at, you know, to new levels and being involved with this team has, has really taken it to new levels. Um, and in terms of the opportunity that sport presents, I think it's a really exciting time. So if we move to the next slide. We have our, our sustainability strategy. So when we set out to set the team out, and it really came off the back of the previous America's Cup. So America's Cup is the oldest sporting trophy in uh, in sport, and was set up in 1851. And there's a really interesting connection to that date because it was all part of the Great Exhibition, which was in the UK, where the the British wanted to showcase all that was great and good about um, innovation and development at the time and industry. And they uh, had this race, this sailing race around the Isle of Wight. And uh, there were several, many, I think 20 or so boats from, from Britain and uh, just one from America which had sailed over and um, sadly beat us hands down. So off went the America's Cup back overseas. And at the time, it wasn't called the America's Cup, but they renamed it because that was the Yacht America which had beaten us. So the 1850s was exactly the same time as the start of the Industrial Revolution. And if you talk to climate scientists, that's the start of the great acceleration of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere as well. So I'm desperately hoping there's a fantastic link to what we're doing with the team at Land Rover BAR and, and hopefully taking it back full circle where we can really showcase how you can be at the top of your game competitive, winning, but do it in such a way that actually you are not driving that, that CO2 and that, that uh, environmental impact in a, in a negative sense. And what we've set out to really do is try and leave a positive impact. So with all that and, and, and off the back of the last America's Cup, Ben had uh, discussions with Wendy Schmidt, who um, is the is the really the inspiration, along with Jeremy Potchman, behind Eleventh Hour Racing, and that is an organisation that has come on board as the team's exclusive sustainability partner, and has been instrumental in actually being at the heart of really giving the opportunity to the team to really look way above and beyond, and, and we call it raising the bar, to, to deliver sustainability. So our strategy looks at driving innovation, uh, smarter futures, and inspiring excellence. So if we just go to the next slide. Is it coming? Hopefully. So if I start oh, on... Oh, that's great. There we go. It's there we photos. Go. Yeah, we're, we're light on text here. <laughs> so. If we start on the smarter futures part of the of the strategy, which is really around how the team operates on a day-to-day -day basis, and um, taking sailors and the and the marine industry, who this was all pretty new to, and even sport actually really quite new. It's been you know if we take where we were three years ago, and where we are now is already a step change. Um, in order to achieve that and put structure and procedures in place, we took the ISO, the 2012-1 management system, and, and embedded that into our operations. So, you know, that came out of the back of the Olympics in London and has really provided a, a really strong, robust framework, if you like, for us to, to uh, first off identify what the, the key issues are, make sure we've got a framework in place to, you know, promote that out to our stakeholders, whether they're internal or external look at how we um, assess those and prioritize which issues to take, put into place a, a whole management system, make sure that you know the legal compliance, the audits, that we're following our own procedures as well as you know what's required of us from legislation and that we're hitting our objective, meeting our objectives and that we're, and that we're um, you know, measuring and monitoring the whole time our progress just from an operational point of view. So we're continually challenging what we do. So the picture up there on the top left was a uh, when we launch the boat, we fill. We have a 200-liter tank of, of uh, water that ballasts the bottom of the wing, so the wing's lifted up by a crane and uh, fixed onto the platform itself, the actual uh, boat, the structure of the boat. 
and that was uh, we were we were just dropping that onto the floor. But you know, you challenge the shore team, and and within you know not even a week, they've come up with a little solution, and we have like a mini recycling unit there. But last year we calculated that that was probably about twenty eight thousand liters of water that we saved just from implementing a simple simple little wing butt solution. And that then we we replicated and and comes with us in the containers around each event. The build of the base we built to Briam Excellent, um, so that there was a new base that was built and that's down in historic Portsmouth, so it's a fantastic uh, sort of opening out to the sea so you can stand on the top of the base and watch the guys out racing and, and uh, t testing their boats. Excuse me. <coughs> and we were lucky enough to have um, a renewable energy partner in Low Carbon who came on board and have... Um, partnered up with us and provided 432 solar panels that you can see there on the top right on our roof. So that generates about 20% of the electricity for the team. The other 80% we, we take from a 100% from renewable energy supply. So the base itself is 100% is green electricity. So you know, that's a really nice statement that we can make and, and, a, and a really nice use of it. We're continually trying to reduce that as well and we monitor it closely. Low carbon also teamed up because we wanted to. We ran out of roof basically. We've covered every spare inch of roof um, with our solar. So we teamed up with a local school and have provided them a slightly smaller but equivalent capacity that, that covers probably 80 90 percent of their electricity use. So we're starting to create these partnerships. Our temporary base out in Bermuda again, low carbon have come on board with us and they have um, put on the uh, on, on the museum behind our base, um, again, a, an, an array, a solar array that will pretty much make our, our energy demands carbon neutral for the time we're out there and leave a legacy on the island itself. Um, <coughs> waste management management's pretty important and we, we look to eliminate single-use plastics. We have our refillable water bottles that the team use day in, day out. You pretty much get jumped on if you have a come into the office with a single-use um, plastic water bottle and so there there we've gone from you know oh that's a bit hard to actually that's just it's just not not a discussion item anymore which is fantastic to see another challenge we had with the base when we built it was um, could we actually enhance the ecology what could we do to benefit the ecology we were on a camber dock very industrial very little um, opportunity to create green roofs because we had solar all over them so what we did was actually host on the back of our pontoon, so uh, you see the two people I'm on the right there, with Amy, our sustainability officer, um, down on our pontoon, we have on the back of them, we host these cages with oysters in. So the Solent oyster fishery collapsed in 2013, and this is a project to really pilot and look at the, the potential for uh, commercial marinas to host adult feet, broodstock oysters to therefore reseed the, the oyster fishery. So um, we teamed up with the Institute for Marine Science <coughs> in Portsmouth who come along and do all the science and the monitoring. So Amy and I every now and then get, get down there and check what they're doing. But most of the time those guys come along and, and check that out. And that project's now gone on to the next level where we have a PhD, two PhD students actually working and are rolling that out across the Solent. So that's a really exciting um, piece of work that we've done. So uh, on to the next slide, um, just a couple more pictures. So we have our urban garden that we have on our, on our roof um, and we have this small shingle beach area at the back which is our little biodiversity hub. So wherever possible we've created these pockets of biodiversity around the base. Um, I mentioned waste management, big for us, so reuse and recycling, we've targeted and we've hit 60% reuse and recycling and then the other 40% goes waste to energy. So for a mixed use, uh, part office, part um, catering, so we have a big uh, food charter as well and we source everything locally and, and seasonally, but the, uh, all the waste that goes and we also have manufacturing waste, we, we target, you know, there's zero to landfill, but we absolutely try and maximise our reuse and recycling of our waste bit there. The chart at the bottom is our, there's a diagram of our picture of, of our base on the on the left there, and the right is our solar. Um, so we we have data that comes in and, and uh, continually informs us on energy consumption as well as our solar power generation. The next <coughs> slide goes on to um, our driving innovation, which is really the the piece where we push the boundaries and use the platform of the team to really drive. Um, 
solutions to problems that we come across. And one of the first things were, you know, was what do we do end of life with our race boats and test boats? By its nature, they're, they're designed to be tested. They're designed to um, <coughs> stimulate the next generation of race boat and, and therefore come reasonably quickly to the end of their life, should we say. Carbon fibre is inherently difficult to recycle. It's a composite product. Um, so we really had to, to look for what were the solutions out there. There are some limited commercially viable solutions, but actually trying to find, um, <coughs> trying to find something uh, that was on our doorstep and had capacity to take was very difficult. So we've done some pilot studies and, and looking at really what we can do there. If we take the next slide. We've looked at alternative materials in building um, our boats, not just our race boats. So we've used our life cycle assessment, so a carbon footprinting really of, of our boats, and we can easily identify that actually a massive piece of opportunity is actually in the mould of the boats and the building of the moulds and the tooling. Um, and the boat that we've made down there on the bottom left is our docking rib. So we built that with uh, over 50 um, apprentices from Southampton City College. And we've used alternative materials there. So we have flax in the floor. We've used a bioresin, so 50% bio uh, rather than fossil-based um, resin system. And we've used the core of the actual sandwich of the, of the, the, the hull, which is a rigid form, is, uh, is made out of recycled PET. So we really started looking at actually what alternative materials and recycled materials are out there. Uh, if we go to the next slide, <laughs> a project that we did this year was um, really looking at that, uh, at, at that manufacturing waste. So the piece of waste that comes out of the whole manufacturing process. And in carbon fiber and in composite manufacture, that's estimated around 40% before you've even got to the end of life. And we uh, teamed up with Anglepoise, who are a, a global brand, but based down in Portsmouth, so local neighbors to us, and built um, this giant Anglepoise lamp. So you see JJ, who was our intern for the summer, and he helped build this giant Anglepoise lamp out of all our scraps. So you can see a close up there of it, which is. Um, made out of the test panels, so we recut the, some test panels that we had um, and we used scraps to make the lamp shade and it was really a demonstration of the circular economy and how we could team up different industries can team up together and actually what's a byproduct of one industry can become an input into another and create some really beautiful products at the end of it. Uh, if we go on to the next, <coughs> excuse me, Inspiring Excellence is the third part of the of the pie if you like um, and we're really keen to make sure that not only do we talk to our fans but we bring that next generation and inspire the next generation in in science engineering technology and maths each uh, event that we go to we've had small um, outreach projects so whether that's with a bunch of kids or and we've given them single-use plastic bottles and we've talked around um, where plastic ends up and the whole uh, link to actually plastic in products that then ends up in ocean plastics, which is our playground and where these kids are learning to sail. So we have a big campaign around say no to single use plastics. Um, also teamed up with BT when they launched their Go 100% campaign all around sport going 100% renewable. If they could get, um, and they were really trying to push that and have been trying to push that through the BT sport viewers. So that's a really interesting campaign there. Um, and the next slide shows some more projects that we've had um, and a really key part of what we've done at the base, the team base is, <coughs> excuse me, the top right project uh, picture you see there is the tech deck. So that's where uh, we have a whole um, area, a zone in, in the team base where we can bring school children to. We can host up to you know 40 kids in that space and really have demos of all the different technology that goes into building that we use day to day building the um, you know in our, in our operations. Whether that's getting the remotely getting the data off the boat to the to the design of, of controls versus speed so the kids you see there are using the 3d um, the uh, oculus goggles and so they're fully immersed and trying to drive the drive the boat there and the picture in the background is the the bone conduction technology that the sailors use in the helmet so we're really immersing these kids or introducing these kids to all the different types of technology that's available and we go out to schools, we've been out to schools and that was just a, a time we went there and engaged with the year six group who were um, a kind of 10, 11 year olds and built, um, planting wild gar garlic with them out in their 
um, out in their uh, little veg patch that they have. So we've been really trying to engage with with that next generation um, and inspire them along. And the uh, last slide I've got, so moving on to the next one, is really our whole <coughs> uh, the whole structure and what we've tried to do is, and it, and it became pretty apparent early on that actually we can achieve way more with our partners. Um, and, and how we could raise the bar through partnerships. So 11th Hour Racing have been absolutely instrumental and in they're from the outset with us. Um, Land Rover is our title sponsor, very key in terms of um, life cycle assessment and that technology piece around recycling of carbon fibre and end of life of carbon fibre. BT we've worked with over um, our supplier tool, we have a sustainability supplier tool that we're currently redeveloping and rolling out to our to our suppliers to help them on this journey as well. How can we get our supply chain to the same standard that we're looking at? Um, Lemta Racing, we have a number of uh, legacy projects out in Bermuda and a big project in, and an awareness raising is around the invasive species, which is the lionfish. Um, and coming up shortly in the next month or so, we have a big cook-off, so bringing celebrity chefs to, um, to to really raise the profile of actually eating these fish and looking at these fish and raising the, the awareness of, the, of them as an invasive species. And out in Bermuda, in our in our base out there, in the, in the hospitality centre and in our team base, we have an exploration zone, which is a mini tech deck, but with a big sustainability focus in there, looking at ocean plastics, looking at the lionfish and those... Um, those types of things. Communications is huge for us. We put sustainability messages out every week. We'll have a message going out there. Um, I talked about the low carbon, the Northern Bridge School life cycle assessment sustainability tool and working with MDL on our oyster pontoon. Um, so we have many collaborative partners and we're always trying to create these partnerships as new um, sponsors and, and new partners come on board. So really looking at driving that um, across the whole piece. Uh, so I have one more slide, which is just a exciting shot of the of the boat, which are pretty unusual and pretty exciting technology. And I think the key thing there is that uh, you know we we have a heap of really clever designers and boat builders at the top end of their sport, designing a boat that's going to go you know more than two and a half times at the the speed of the wind, uh, purely powered by the wind. And there's a lot of opportunity there too drive some of that technology into into mainstream, not just in, in the marine industry, but also into, into other industries and take that forward. So um, that's me for the moment. Brilliant. Thanks a million, Sue. That's uh, fascinating in terms of all the things you've covered there. And there's some, some really key things, I think, that are coming through from both your and um, Julia's intervention, who's now back on the line as well. So the first thing I want to note really is, um, obviously, we're talking about innovation and technology. Um, and the one thing, obviously, that strikes me about both of your organizations is that you really have completely changed the face of either your sport in terms of Formula E actually creating its own sport that's really embedded in this, or um, or yourself, Susie, in terms of the team, you know, going to these extreme, you know, really above and beyond extreme lengths to, to make sure everything's sort of as carbon neutral as it can be. So I think just as a general opener question to you both, what what do you think is the, the key component to getting to this stage for you both? Because obviously we speak to many, many stakeholders um, across various sports and there is always, you know, other priorities which is completely understandable um, in terms of the sport itself, you know, the, the, the players or the athletes or um, the foundation that goes along with it, the marketing, the broadcasting, there's so many components that go with it and it seems like sometimes sustainability is is seen as almost a bit of a pain, like, all oh, we have to do it, we really want to do it, but it's just finding the time. Um, so I'd love to get just, first of all, both of your um, perspectives, maybe starting with you, Susie, on, on how this started off and why you've made sustainability so core cool and how actually, you know, it, it's, it's made these huge strides in, in the success of where you are in terms of your tournament, etc. Yeah, I think... Um you know, I think I think Ben had got to a point in his career where he, you know, he's four-time gold medalist. He's got a silver that he tucked in his back pocket as well. So he's been involved, you know, over five Olympic cycles. That's 20 years of, you know, top of your game in the Olympics. And this was an opportunity. And I think meeting Wendy Smith early on in those, you know, she pretty much instilled on him, you've got a massive opportunity here to put something back and use your profile and your position to really drive good in this and I think he got up to that stage in his career where he said you know what I have 
now that in itself isn't going to wash itself and I think what we miss and, and recent you know discussions in in the sport and sustainability forum we've all felt that actually that whole business case and being able to really articulate that business case it's you know for, from where I sit it seems obvious but it's but it's obviously it, it's not obvious and I think there's definite cost you know if you're resource efficient then that's going to drive uh, you know a, a, a financial benefit without doubt but that's but that's only so much and it might take a bit of bit of effort in in putting those those building blocks and those pieces into place the next bit is actually how do you use that to you know be more attractive resonate better with your sponsors or your partners but equally I think there's a piece there about this is what the next generation expect as well and if you want to attract the brightest and the best they want to know that you're an organization who cares we have lots of chat around the Millennials and 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 that kind of um, you know that that being the next generation companies are really starting to look at this as actually we want to attract the best just being an exciting sports team probably won't be enough going forward um, so I think there's a number of different areas of where uh, not just you know not just being resource efficient financially efficient being more attractive to sponsors as the whole sort of global marketplace changes but actually attracting people but actually creating that that, uh, that environment that that people like and that productive environment that, that people want to be there because actually it feels good you're exciting you're cutting edge of your sport but you're actually also doing some really cool stuff that's making a difference in you know alongside you know winning winning an America's Cup team yeah an amazing halo effect as they call it in terms of <laughs> absolutely absolutely killing it and also feeling quite smug about it as well yeah. <laughs> because you're doing well, it and it's being able to articulate that to those who aren't in that space and haven't you know, quite got to that level of of realising it. I mean, we've been amazingly lucky with eleventh hour racing coming on board early on to to really, you know, make us make us do it across everything and, and make that possible. Um, and and now, you know, the evidence is there. So hopefully, we can take that and showcase that to to others. You know, and the more like us and and, and Julia and Formula E, the I think the more commonplace we'll find it. Yeah. Absolutely, I totally agree with that. And and um, what about your side, Julia? In terms of, I mean, the, you know, Formula E is a whole new sport that's entirely dedicated to this. So, you know, where do you get the the chops to get that off the ground? <laughs> yeah, I mean, for us, it, as 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 I mentioned during my presentation, it, it was it was uh, different in the sense that Formula E has been created around the the idea of sustainability and this mission to to give the solution to. To global warming, or at least to offer one of the solutions to fight global warming. Obviously, one of the one of the key things for us has been um, the support of, of the management uh, of Formula E in general, and the support of FIA in helping us build uh, out of the ground. I would say uh, a, new, a completely new championship, completely disruptive in the motorsport industry. Uh, as um, as Susie was mentioning, uh, we, we really are targeting a new and younger audience because that's the young generation who are we are hoping to see buying electric vehicles and uh, who are very uh, I would say keen about sustainability because they are those that might not have any more uh, planets to live to live in um, and um, the the sponsors that are attracted uh, um, within Formula E are coming uh, because of uh, those those sustainable reasons and those sustainable credentials. So it's been really important for us to um, to make sure that we we engage with those stakeholders. And one of the big thing I didn't really emphasize on that uh, during the presentation, but one of the big things is that we've been following, uh, I would say, the framework of the same uh, ISO 2001, which is the sustainable even economic international standard. And uh, that's really key because uh, ultimately what we do is that we produce events in cities and uh, since we, we, are, um, we are sending uh, sustainable messages uh, about electric vehicles, it's, it's really key that our events uh, reflect who we are and, uh, and what we do. Yeah, definitely. So that's um, it's fascinating insights, and um, from you know both of you obviously being real pioneers in this area, which is which is brilliant. So we're going to pop over to some um, questions that are coming in. And um, firstly, Julia, for you, um, 
on the kind of you know the idea of technology and also the wider stuff around sports fan en engagement. I, I, would you be able to tell us a bit about the fan boost? I don't think you mentioned that, and I think that is really interesting. It's it's technology. It's interactive. It's you know it's it's part of the sustainability. You know, it's really galvanised a lot of interest. So what's the what's the fan boost about? Sure. So the fan boost is a, is a way for uh, people to vote uh, on their uh, on their phones or through the website uh, for their favorite driver and to give an extra boost of power to three drivers uh, during each race. So that uh, the extra boost that the drivers have is, uh, I would say, is giving them more or less the opportunity to do a decisive uh, overtake. So it's, it's really important, and it, it will come back to the, to the philosophy of Formula E and the fact that we want to be a younger and accessible sport uh, because sustainability is not, is not I mean, I've, I've focused a lot on the environmental benefits and the benefits on the society, but also um, the, the sustainable approach of the championship is really to be obviously engaging and really inclusive, and that's what we wanted. We wanted the fans to be able to influence and to to feel that the race is, is directly also their race and that their favorite driver will make a difference. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. I think that's this, this wider conversation around fan engagement and taking, you know, either a really high level sport like um, the America's Cup or a sport like Formula E where it's these, you know, cars and tracks and really engaging fans and, and driving that momentum and driving it into everyday, um, everyday thoughts and people and stuff I think is really key. So that's a fascinating thing way of, of that happening. And Susie, for you, there's a question around, um, which I think is quite funny, but it's, it's also really interesting, is in terms of the cost comparison to a normal boat, because obviously there's probably not that many people who are in the market <laughs> to do what you're doing. Um, but I think it's an interesting question, because cost parity is, again, one of the main barriers of you know, sustainable technology or renewable energy, or you know, it always comes down to cost parity. So I think, I don't know if you have um, visibility over that, or if you can give us some thoughts on kind of cost comparisons or price parity. Uh, I'm not sure quite what I mean by normal boat. That could be a dinghy, which you can pick up for, for next to nothing. I mean, I think our, our boat is built like all the other race boats, and the the actual boat itself, the material that goes into the build of the race boat out on the water, is actually uh, a tiny percentage of the overall material that goes into the act, its actual construction and manufacturing, because you have the molds, you have the um, the tooling and, and and pieces, and you have the wastage that comes around it. So from going through our our carbon footprinting and going through through that whole life cycle assessment you know methodology we could identify that actually do you know what the, the the race boat itself the actual boat itself is only ever going to be top of the range it's going to be built out unless there is a rule which comes in and, and um, you know and, and, and makes it across the board you're pretty much told what materials you can build it out of the design is, is a little bit much you know, up to you. Um, if we can, if we can design out the wastage, and if we can uh, use recycled content in our molds, because the mold itself only has to, it only has to behave the same way as the material in the race boat when it's cooked, because you cook these in in massive ovens. If we can design efficiency in there, then we'll make reasonably large cost savings. I mean, if you take a a, a kilo of um, of carbon fiber, just, you know, virgin carbon fiber, that can be anywhere from 20, 30 pounds um, a kilo, whereas a, a recycled material mat that we could use in the mold, in the toolings, would be uh, about four or five. So it's, if we can do that and we can get it to a stage where we can manufacture it to the, uh, to the quality we need, then, then it's going to be, it's going to be a cost saving. I just think it's not used at the moment because it's not, it's not in the thought process, it's not in the psyche that actually you can use this stuff and you can use this material. So I'd like to think that actually it's a, it's a cost saving. It, the, each boat, race boat is, they're, they're comparable in, in, um, in the materials that, that go into the race boat itself. Brilliant, and um, that's super. Um, Judith, so we're, we've got about five minutes left, so I'll just try and squeeze another couple in before we come to kind of final thoughts and wrap up. Um, so, Judith, I've had a question for you, which is, again is is a more general one, um, but around what surprises you the most about the electric car racing industry? Sorry, can you repeat it again, sir? Yeah, of course. Um, the question was um, from Susie Day on Twitter. What surprises you Hello. most? electric car racing industry.
Hello? Is it gone? Hello? Can you hear me, Julia? Oh, I think we've lost Julia. Susie, are you still there? I'm still here. Yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> I don't know. Julia, hopefully, can is maybe I'm, dropped out. I'm back. I think, oh, I think there's some... Sorry. I think the, <laughs> the, the, there, was a, there was an issue with the sound. Oh, don't worry. We love it. It's, there's always technology blips. Standard. <laughs> so, Susie Day asked you on Twitter, Julia, what surprises you the most about the electric car racing industry? Um, probably the fact that it's a, it's a very resilient industry um, in the sense that it's, it's, it's been an industry that uh, has been around, I would say, uh, for years and decades. Then it was completely for, uh, forgotten uh, to, to benefit, the, let's say, the, the classic um, in, engine industry. And um, suddenly when there are like, issues with the, with the fossil fuels, uh, you see that this industry is coming back and that the car manufacturers are investing uh, in research and development and that they are testing solutions and that they are able to uh, join forces and work together uh, so that uh, they, will, they will help and push the, the technology around electric vehicles. So that's, that's, probably, that's probably it. I think it's, it's, it's really uh, full of, of promises when, when you see that people uh, decide to get together uh, so that to push a new technology. Yeah, absolutely. Basil, so unfortunately we're, we're coming to the end of time. We've got some other questions that have come through that we haven't had time for, but we'll drop those through to Susie and Julia and hopefully get some, some answers through Twitter on those for you. Um, so firstly, I would like to just say thanks a million um, to Julia Pally and Susie Thompson for joining us today. Thanks a million, ladies. It's been a pleasure to, to have you here and talk about what you're doing. Um, in in the industry in motorsport and in and in sailing as well. So thanks a million for coming along. You're very welcome. Thank you very Thanks. much. And I guess from our from our side, you know, we've heard um, a lot today um, about these sports and the idea of technology driving sustainability in sport, which is just one component of an overall holistic um, view of the way sustainability is being embedded into sport and through through fan engagement and in a wider scale as well. And messages for me today have really been around how sustainability, you know, can be comparable on cost. Um, this kind of idea of these pioneers um, who are really um, forward-facing, appealing to a younger generation, and and really uh, mixing things up and and driving for for better, um, bigger and better all the times. That kind of um, theme as well. This kind of halo effect of of um, the fact that we can feel good about the fact that we can enjoy the sports that we love, um, whilst also benefiting the environment and, and social community. There's so many different facets to it. Um, and this idea of partnerships as well, and um, the fact that none of us can really do any of this together, and this idea of partnerships is really key as well. So thanks a million to Julia and Pally, um, uh, Julia and Susie, sorry. Um, and we're excited to see you all in Munich in a few weeks for Sustainable Innovation in Sport. Um, but that's all for us, so um, we will be putting this recording on the website should you want to check it out um, and listen again, um, and the slides will be available there as well. But otherwise, from everyone at Climate Action um, and from Julia and Susie, thanks a million. Have a lovely day, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.